Welcome everyone. Um, I'm just going to talk really loud, like the whole time. And, you know, if I, uh, the mic will probably be fine, but who knows, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. I, I'm Tim Puko, the climate correspondent at the Washington Post. Uh, I just want to thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, our, our panel is called Bridging the Divide, Making Action on the Energy Transition a Reality. Uh, we're, we're very excited. We have some great panelists. Uh, we're going to be webcasting this live. Uh, and the full video will also be available in days to come. Uh, so for those of you uh, joining us via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists uh, at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And right now, I just want to introduce us, uh, introduce all of you. Uh, I think we all know one another, so I don't know. You might encounter this. I don't know how often I'm going to know what I'm talking about, but we're going to get through this together. <laughs> and, and so first of all, I, I want to introduce you to Jason Bordon. Uh, Jason is the founding director here at the Center on Global Energy Policy, uh, and he's the one who brought us all together today. Uh, and next to him, we have Al Abigail Dillon, uh, who's the president of Earth Justice, a, a top environmental law firm. Uh, and then we have uh, Stephen Gilbo, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change uh, for the Canadian government. And, and next to him is Catherine Hayhoe. Uh, she is the director, uh, or the, excuse me, the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so you know, we're going to be going through a, a, a lot of questions today. We're going to have questions for, for you, time for you to ask questions, uh, maybe in the last 10 or 15 minutes too. Uh, but right now, I just want to turn to Jason uh, just to get us started. Uh, you wrote a, a, a column recently uh, about what we've seen from the oil industry uh, and its action on climate change, or maybe it's a retrenchment on some of that action uh, it, it, over the past year. Uh, I, I, I'll just kind of ask you broadly, like to, to kind of, describe that to su summarize that and and especially like did you have a bit of an epiphany at all over the past year as we've seen a, a bit of a, a change in tactics from the oil industry um i don't know it, was, it wasn't an, an, an epiphany i was just sort of commenting on what we've been seeing uh in the last year plus uh you know if we're if we're going to make this transition happen at anywhere close to the scale and speed we need it's a herculean task we need all hands on deck the potential for capital budgets and engineering expertise that some of the biggest companies have for solutions that we will need, um, like carbon capture or others, as well as dramatic expansion in EVs and renewables is real. And what, notwithstanding that, what we are seeing is that the industry as a whole, and that is painting with a broad brush, but let's say the industry as a whole is spending a few percentage points of, of CapEx at a time of very high record profits on clean energy. Uh, in an environment that has renewed concerns about energy security and energy prices, cost of clean energy after decade, after years of decline, actually starting to reverse like offshore wind in, in some cases. It's important to remember when we talk about the industry, uh, more than half the world's oil production is nationally owned oil companies, not just the household names uh, we tend to think of uh, or see on street corners at gasoline stations. And I think a key point, and, and we did see over the last year, some prominent Um, targets or, or commitments that have been made. Um, I think a key point is that if, in my view, if inside boardrooms or, or, or in companies, one believed with conviction that we would get anywhere close to net zero by 2050, people would be behaving very differently than they are today. Mm -hmm. And so the, the despite rhetorical, some rhetorical commitments, the, behave, the, the actions we're seeing mm -hmm. suggest uh, either companies don't believe uh, that we are going to really get to these goals or take them seriously, uh, or that if we do, it's a lot harder to make money, maybe, uh, in that world of clean energy than it is with continued um, reliance on profits from oil and gas. And and some shareholders seem to share that view. Not not all, because at least some companies got a bit of a bump for 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 pulling back a little bit from some some of the commitments. I think in the long run, that's a bad bet. Uh, I think Catherine has been maybe more eloquent than anyone uh, uh, about this and, and what's coming. Um, just because this can't continue, in order to believe, uh, and we saw this this week with an op-ed from the head of the IEA, Fatih Barol, saying oil, gas, and coal use would peak by the end of the decade. There was a strong response from the head of OPEC mm -hmm. to that, which said, no, that's not right. We're going to... Oil's going to, don't tell everyone that's going to happen. Oil, oil and gas use are going to keep rising. 
net zero doesn't mean zero oil and gas. There's still, even in the IEA modeling, there's still oil and gas, but much less than today. You don't take goals like net zero 2050 without a sharp decline, maybe not to zero, in oil use and in gas use. And um, in order to believe that oil use will remain at current levels for decades to come, you need to believe that, broadly speaking, we'll be okay with failing by, by large amounts to meet our climate goals. And, and again, I think other people here, uh, Abby and Catherine, others are pretty eloquent in what that would mean and why the, the consequences of that are just not, not acceptable. I mean, I, I think in the end, the, the tipping points that we will see not only potentially in climate change, but in social mobilization to do something about it, those I think history teaches us when you look at environmental pollution in the US through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then one in 10 Americans came out into the streets together in the first Earth Day in 1970 and said, this has to stop. We can't have air, we can't breathe, and water, we can't drink, and lakes, our, our kids can't swim, and something has to change. And that sort of led to the landmark environmental laws that still guide us today from the early 1970s. The famous American economist, uh, famous, but American economist Herbert Stein uh, once, once said, if something cannot continue forever, it will stop. And I sort of feel like that's true for climate. We just don't know how and when and how nonlinear that'll be and how disruptive. Uh, but it's why I think a bet on business as usual for decades to come is probably not a good one. And then ultimately, it's important to say to solve climate change, we not only need more leadership from the biggest energy companies, we need broad structural systemic change to start making sure that demand starts falling quickly. If oil demand keeps rising and any particular companies decide to pull back and stop investing, you know, one of two things happens. Prices spike. And we know what the political response will be to that when people are running for re-election. Won't allow that to happen, whatever it takes. Or other companies will step in to fill the void. There's no lack of hydrocarbons to produce somewhere else in the world. So we need simultaneously to be doing all of these things and making sure that we are thinking about how to increase social mobilization thinking about how to make sure we implement the IRA successfully and then thinking about what comes next after the IRA, whether it's in Washington or in Brussels or in capitals and emerging and developing economies where the biggest growth in emissions is gonna come from in decades to come, just to make sure that we transition this entire system again with the scale and speed we need because we're gonna hear at COP this year in the stock tank that we are not on track. Uh, so we need to move a lot faster. Jason, if I could distill that for a second, the issue was that the oil companies pledged that they were going to make big investments to go into renewables, or at least some of them did, and go towards net zero, reducing their emissions. Um, but as they've made more money, as oil prices have gone up, they didn't really invest that money into their renewables business, into their zero carbon business. Yeah, and again, it, the, it, it is, I mean, you, you look right. at the data from the IEA, it's it's a few percentage points for the industry as a whole. The IEA will, you know, some are higher, 15, 20%. So there's heterogeneity there. But broadly speaking, uh, that is the case. And um, and I think what, what one would hear is it's hard to make as much money in a lot of those areas of clean energy as it is right now with very high oil and gas prices. And we need to like struggle with that reality and change that reality. So yes, need to push for leadership, need to push companies to do more. And one of the best ways to make that happen faster is to change that playing field through policy like the IRA and, and a host of other ways where there's huge economic opportunities to invest more in the clean energy transition and shareholders will appreciate that and reward it, not penalize it. So if, you know, if they've shown some, some wavering, I think there's a big question about what we do about this. Abby, I'm going to come to you with this. I, I want to present a contrast here uh, because, you know, I, I just met with John Kerry yesterday. He's meeting with many oil companies while he's here. Um, he and many others in the administration say you can't solve climate change without the oil and gas companies. Jigger Shot, DOE always makes the point. They're the ones with the access to capital to scale up, to do solutions as, as quickly as we need. But I, I want to read this from um, Derek Brower, his farewell column at the FT. Um, he looks at this from another way, though. Um, Remington was good at typewriters, but not the personal computer. Why expect ExxonMobil or Saudi Aramco to lead or even survive a shift from their core businesses of digging up fossil fuels and selling them? And do you really want them to? So if we need these guys, but uh, I don't know if we can trust them, even if they wanted to be good, you know, Remington, point there. Uh, what, what, what do we what do? We do? How, do we, how do we manage all that? So I think we have to have a power analysis. Is there any business that's accountable to shareholders? 
that would ever see the power, political power, as well as raw energy power, um, and profits that they currently have? Is there any industry that would do that voluntarily? I think we're seeing the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're beautifully teeing up this dilemma, which is how can you take power from such a politically powerful industry that, for instance, in this country has the ability to manipulate prices to determine an election? Mm -hmm. um, how do you take that power when you still need that industry? Even net zero isn't without oil and gas. You have the world dependent still 82 to 86% on fossil fuels. We don't want this to be a transition that leaves people without a basic need. It needs to be orderly. And this is the group of people that, as you say, has the most access to capital and perhaps technology to create the ability to achieve negative emissions. Are they using the R&D capital that the IRA is providing to them to do that? I'll give one example. We've just seen the DOE approve the first big direct air capture projects in Louisiana, one of our fossil fuel hubs, globally important one. And one of the potential beneficiaries, the contract hasn't been worked out, but is Occidental, whose um, CEO is saying what the world needs is zero carbon oil. So they're going to use a very intensive energy, energy intensive <laughs> system to extract more oil and burn it and call it, it, it there's actually a funny move she makes from net zero to zero carbon oil. Like that's, that's probably not a great use of public funds. It's probably not moving us forward to what the IPC says we need, which is to stop oil and gas extraction to make a full energy transition or as full a transition as we possibly can make, and then take more CO2 out of the air. And so we're just, as we're heading into the COP, where the discussion will be about less about energy transition, but about abating fossil fuels, we are in conversation about how as a society, as a US society, as a global society, let me pause on U.S. society. We're the biggest oil and gas producer in the world. So it matters what our society thinks about the, the future of fossil fuels. We're really in a conversation about, can we do it? Can we do what the scientists are telling us we have to do, which is get off fossil fuels to the maximum extent we possibly can? And as that deadline to do it comes, the economic and otherwise disruptive nature of that transition is, I think, suggesting even to some very uh, good faith climate hawks that maybe we can't do it. Maybe we have to buy a very in expensive insurance policy in, for example, carbon capture and sequestration at scale, not to draw down emissions, but to preserve an industry that we're very familiar with. So I I'm in the, in the farewell FT letter camp that I don't think we can trust the oil and gas industry, certainly voluntarily, to just manage this transition on their own. The pressures, and I know lots of people in this industry, they're creative and great. They understand geology and culture and profits. Like these are creative, amazing people whose minds and energy can be put to good use. But within the system that they are operating under quarterly profit deadlines, I, I'm not mm -hmm. seeing it. And so I think we need a societal agreement, which I know you can speak to better than anyone. I think we need the kinds of mandates um, that Minister Gobo is, is, is putting in, in um, Canada. Our carrots in the IRA are fantastic. I've lobbied my head off <laughs> to, to pass that bill, but it's not enough. And we're gonna need um, a, a durable and clear signal that this country is getting off fossil fuels so that industry believes it. Mm -hmm. Because until you believe it, there's no reason to shrink what is a wildly successful profit model right now. Super uh, quick. Go, oh, okay. sure. And then I'll be quiet because we have brilliant leaders and climate communicators like Catherine here. But just a nuance on, on, on what Abby said. Um, one, one of the challenges, I think, is also different investor bases. At a time of high oil and gas prices, 
there are some investors out there who want the returns from those high oil prices. And if you're a major energy company and you pivot too far in the direction of moving your investment to clean energy, you might be penalized by the shareholder base. There's another group of shareholders that want to invest in transition. And for many of these, many of these companies we're talking about may never be green enough. And there really, there's a tension there, which may make it difficult to the point about Remington or whatever. Do the can, can companies do both? Do at some point do, do we need to start? Might we see a split where there's kind of a transition arm and a legacy arm, and companies start doing a d- different things? Uh, I think we'll see how that plays out in the years to come. Uh, Mr. Gilbo, uh, Abby was talking a lot about uh, a more active role. For government, mm-hmm. and you're the government guy here on, on our panel, so you get the next question. <laughs> okay, um, you've also got a, a giant oil industry in Canada. It's a, it's a big part of, of the the cultural fabric and certainly the economic fabric there. So, you know, I, I might want to ask a follow up on on that element. But if we could just get started um, with this idea of government taking a more active mm-hmm. role, uh, Canada, the Trudeau government has done a lot in the past year and a half. Can you explain? Um, the biggest things, probably the 2030 plan, and then especially some of the bigger steps that that have happened recently in the the past few months. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And thank you so much for having a Canadian uh, politician here on on, on your stage. Um, So, I I mean, our climate action started before I was nominated a year and a half ago. Uh, In in 2018, we introduced carbon pricing in in, in Canada, and and we had to fight all the way to the Supreme Court because we were sued by uh, by many of our jurisdictions. We call them provinces and, and, and territories in Canada. Uh, we won in the, in, in the Supreme Court. So right now in Canada, uh, carbon pricing is at $65 a ton. It will go up to $170 a ton by, by 2030. So we know, six, we know 65 is not enough. And, and we know it's going to really start to bite when we get around $100 a ton. So we're, so we're, so we're getting there. It's, it's going up by $15 um, a year. Uh, in the last year and a half, I've uh, I've adopted uh, clean fuel regulations to ensure that uh, that uh, refineries uh, reduce the carbon footprint uh, and, and through regulations the carbon footprint of the fuel and diesel that that, that they sell. Uh, we've presented draft regulations for a zero uh, vehicle zero emission vehicle mandate um, draft regulations just before Christmas. Final regulations before COP will be so to force car companies to get to 100 percent. Uh, zero emission vehicle by 2035 in in, in Canada, 60 percent by by 2030. Uh, we have we already have existing methane regulation for the oil and gas sector to reduce methane emissions in that sector by at least 40 percent by 2025. We want to get to at least 75 percent reduction of methane emissions in the oil and gas sector by 2030. Draft regulations will be coming before before COP. Uh, what else? I'm forgetting something. Uh, uh, cl- clean electricity regulation. So we want our electricity sector to be net zero by 2035. Those draft regulations uh, were, were published uh, earlier this summer. We're the first G20 country to eliminate uh, fossil fuel subsidy, a federal federally supported fossil fuel subsidy. Uh, we did that at the beginning of, of the summer, and we were the only G20 country that has a commitment to also eliminate public financing for, for, for fossil fuels. So crown corporations that would offer things like uh, loan guarantees. So they're not direct subsidies, according to the WTO definitions, but they're still support for, 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 for the oil and gas sector. Um, and there's a couple of other things we're doing. So I, we believe that, um, so I think I agree with Abigail, like, as a, as a legislator, as a regulator, uh, voluntary measures won't get, and, and Jason as well, voluntary measures won't get us to where we need to go, which is why we're using every possible tool at our disposal. We're also, we're also using carrots as well, not as much as in the US, but, but I mean, we're at $200 billion of committed investment in Canada in transit. Uh, green, clean tech, renewables, uh, adaptation to to, to to climate change, green, greener buildings. So it's not it's not the three hundred eighty billion dollars of of the IRA in, in the U.S., but we're ten we're ten times smaller. So we like to think that we punch above our weight compared to you guys, if I may. Um, so carrots are important, but but we believe that the use of of, of regulatory tools and and mechanisms like 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 pricing carbon is um, are, are very important. 
Uh, but it's it's challenging. Uh, it's a challenging environment um, right now for the climate change debate, certainly in the U.S. and Canada as well. It, that debate has got caught in, in, in into the culture wars, and, and and we're seeing that in other parts of the world uh, as well. I have to stand up in the House of Commons every day to to defend to de- to defend carbon pricing, mm-hmm. to, de- to defend clean fuel regulations, because our equivalent of the Republicans in in Canada has made this one of their main targets for, for 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 the next election they've lost two elections on carbon pricing so i get i guess they didn't get the memo um happy to fight them uh, on a third election on, on on carbon pricing but we believe that these tools are, are, are very important and it is only by using all of the available tools that we have as uh, as lawmakers that that we can uh, that we can hope to achieve our, our our paris commitment targets so you alluded to some of the domestic political struggles that you have to deal with in trying to get these programs through and i think you know our audience here i'm sure um in new york sees this with the American government all the time. There are huge political obstacles to passing anything. Um, but I, I want to shift and, and point out that, well, there are international obstacles too. Um, you still have uh, a robust oil industry in Canada, and oftentimes internationally that frustrates other partners that, that you need to come along to do all these other clean energy things. Uh, and so on the 2030 plan, I, I, I just want to mention uh, that, that Canada's National Observer um, was, uh, you know, kind of pulled out some stats from it and pointed out that um, even though you're doing all these things on clean energy, there's also an expectation that oil production rises. I think 33% for, by your own projections from 2020 to 2030. And I, I just want to, to hear a little bit about, you know, how, how you justify that and, and how you balance that, uh, or I guess how that complicates the balance uh, with trying to reduce emissions and, and promote clean energy too. So our energy regulator recently, uh, at the end of the spring, published a, a new outlook for, for energy production in, in, in Canada and energy demand. And, and they looked at three scenarios. One, business as usual, which is the 33% that the National Observer is referring to, I believe. And two, um, IEA uh, compliant uh, s- scenarios where we would see uh, oil and gas production peak uh, uh, at around 2027 in Canada and decline uh, rather, I mean, depending on which scenarios, but either by a third or two thirds by, by 2050. Mm. So we are having this conversation about production in, in Canada. It's very challenging for a federal politician in our federation mm. to, to go after production of natural resources because it's a provincial jurisdiction as per our constitution. So the tools that I have at my disposal as as federal environment and climate change minister is tackling the pollution, the emissions. The Supreme Court was very clear on that. Federal government Mm -hmm. can do that. So which is why I can go after methane, which is why I will be tabling uh, regulations to cap the emissions of the oil and gas sector. It's going to be a cap and cut. So I'm saying regardless of what happens to production of oil and gas in Canada, the emissions will need to go down. And then the companies will have to figure it, to, fi- to figure out how they do that. Do they do that through investment in CCS or other forms of technology? What, what path they want to, to, to choose to achieve those uh, those emission levels that will be set in, in, in law in Canada? Um, Catherine, I want, I want to come to you. We're, we're, there was, a, 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 I felt a bit of a consensus there over the last two answers about the need to have uh, all types of different yeah. solutions. So when it comes to the continued fossil fuel production in, in Canada, and even the U.S., it's in the Inflation Reduction Act, the big climate spending bill from last year. There are a lot of provisions for um, hydrogen off the fossil fuel base. There are provisions for um, carbon capture. Of course, there's a ton of money going into wind, solar, batteries, all of that. Can you give us a sense of, of like which of these things are most effective and, and the way governments that are taking action um, how effective you think it'll be to have this embrace of so many different types of strategies, even those that often include uh, what's ultimately fossil fuel technology? Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> I absolutely can. And what I would say is there is no silver bullet. <laughs> you will see headlines in newspapers saying, is this the next silver bullet? And the answer is always no, <laughs> it is not. <laughs> but the good news is, is there's a lot of silver buckshot. And what that means is we have solutions across the spectrum that together can truly tackle this issue at scale. So let me put some numbers on what everyone said so far. Out of all of our heat trapping gas emissions, about three quarters of those come from the fossil fuel industry. 
Over 80% comes from actually burning the coal, gas, and oil, and the rest of it comes from methane leaking from oil wells and coal mines and um, other extraction processes. So we need solutions across the spectrum that address the ag sector, the land use sector, deforestation, and fossil fuels, because that's 100%. But fossil fuels are 75% of that. So that's why our, our conversation is focused on this. If you look at direct air capture, which Abby brought up, that's the idea that by passing air through a filter, we can actually suck the carbon out of the atmosphere. And it's amazing. It was originally invented by these uh, two Swiss academics at ETH Zurich, who then created Climeworks, which is a really interesting organization that is at the forefront of direct air capture today. And Climeworks estimates, because I was just with them a little while ago, that if we put everything we could into direct air capture by 2050, it could take up 2.5% of fossil fuel emissions. <laughs> everything we have. So like you said, we need everything, but it is one piece of silver buckshot. It's not even the biggest. Two bigger pieces that we haven't mentioned so far are efficiency and nature. The cheapest form of energy is the energy we don't use. And in the United States, 67% of our energy is wasted. In Canada, we're slightly better, but not that much better. Working on it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Working on it with some of the carrots that you mentioned from, from carbon pricing. Uh, and then what about nature? It turns out carbon is essential to life. We're all carbon-based life forms, but we just have too much of it in the atmosphere and we need to put it somewhere else. Nature has the ability to take up to a third of our carbon out of the atmosphere over the next decade. That's a really big piece of buckshot. While also addressing concerns like the biodiversity crisis and the sovereignty of indigenous peoples to manage their own lands. So I actually didn't mention any of the work that Canada's doing in that area too, but that is part of the climate portfolio is investing in nature and investing in people and equity. So we need all of these. So my answer to your question is yes, all of the above. But like you just said, you can't depend on the goodwill of industries who are and have been for decades the most influential and wealthy in the world to do it out of the goodness of their hearts when the quarterly returns are what they're judged on. It just makes no sense. So we need the policy mechanisms. And there are carrots like the IRA that have spurred manufacturing, especially in red states down the middle of the country for batteries and wind and solar. But we also need the policies to set those regulations in place to say, here's a goal and together we have to achieve that goal. And you know what's really interesting? There is support across almost every country in the G20, widespread support for climate action. When you ask people, should the government be doing what it takes to tackle the climate crisis at scale? Almost three quarters of people across all G20 countries say yes. So there is the public support and that is why we need the government policy. We can't depend on companies to do it themselves, but we need every piece of buckshot we have at the table. Now, I know you all want to talk a little more about the IRA. And so for the audience, let me take a second. Um, I, I am always surprised at, at how few people know what the IRA is. So forgive me if you all do, but I just want to be super sure. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act passed uh, a, about a year ago now uh, by the U.S. Congress, pushed by President Biden. Um, even though it is called the Inflation Reduction Act, is largely a climate spending bill depending on how you measure, somewhere between $250 billion and, and maybe a trillion, if you believe estimates from Goldman Sachs, will ultimately be um, provided by the U.S. government for climate-friendly programs, a lot of them in, in renewable energy, wind, battery, solar, but as we've been discussing, some of it for you know, fossil fuel technologies as well. Uh, we've, we've talked about the silver buckshot idea, you got to do everything. So Abby, I want you, I want to hear your opinion for a second about, uh, about this climate spending package. And I want to know what you think about how we're balancing those different types of solution in, in, in this silver buckshot. Are we putting enough emphasis on the right ones and, and keeping others at maybe a, a correctly proportional like amount? Like what, what do you think about how we're balancing these different options? Well, let me say the, the top three things that I wish I could wave a magic wand and change. <laughs> One is that you have to say what the IRA is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always got to say it. Always got to say it. Um, because it is a signal accomplishment. I remember watching the Senate vote and, and the idea of getting the U.S. Senate to finally pass a climate bill. Thought you might wait your whole life for that. Mm -hmm. And um my sister had a baby during it. I went, was in her labor, and I came back, and they were still voting. <laughs> it was an emotional day, but I, you know, I couldn't, 
stop crying because my feeling was now we got a chance. Now we have a chance. Um, The second thing I wish people knew is that it's um, a compromise. It's, I would characterize it beyond all the buckshot, more of an all of the above policy. Um, And that was the political compromise that was necessary. And so from my perch at Earth Justice, where we're often involved in permitting fights on the ground, we're seeing what's getting built. On the one hand, I want everybody to know that this year alone, there are 272 new major clean facilities that will change the U.S. economy. And that's in year one. Mm -hmm. If you remember what it was like immediately when that act passed, the, the gloss on it was, oh, my God, this requires the government to move quickly with industry to build stuff. We don't know how to do that in the United States anymore. It's going to be a disaster. and We're going to have a solely injured fight every day. That's not, you know, I'll, I'll add that to the one things I hope never happen. But but we are moving. Industry is getting the signal and things are changing on the ground. The facts are changing on the ground. And so I think there's enormous potential in the industrial strategy if people know about it, understand it, and learn to love it, um, heading into an election year, I'll add. Mm-hmm. So, um, but on the other hand, we have two areas of the country, very politically powerful, the Gulf South, Louisiana and Texas, and um, the Ohio River Valley of Appalachia, West Virginia is part of that. And these are regions <clears throat> that do not yet have a vision of what it looks like to be post-fossil fuels. And those are places where we are tripling down on a fossil economy. Mm -hmm. And we can't get there in the US and we can't get there globally if that's the direction. So um, in a series of weeks or months, we may see EPA hand over the keys to injection wells in Louisiana and then Texas, West Virginia would follow. Let's look and see what our hydrogen tax credits end up, but there could be massive subsidies for fossil hydrogen as well as green, hopefully not. But depending on how the IRA is executed, we could see a massive new wave of fossil construction Mm -hmm. subsidized by Mm -hmm. taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And so it's, we have to keep in mind that this is not a self executing plan. When I listen to you talk, Mm -hmm. I am amazed at how direct the strategy is. It's regulations about emissions, about carbon. We don't have that in the United (laughs) States. We have it in some states, really important. We need to have it in more states. And if anyone's seen it, Rhodium just put out a good analysis of how we get to our Paris commitments. The states play an enormous Mm -hmm. role in that. But we do not have a national energy policy that is directed expressly at carbon. And so what that means is the execution, where the money is channeled from the IRA Mm -hmm. is is what the end result will be. Mm -hmm. And it could be a result that's pretty mixed and does as much for fossil fuel companies that are wired to take advantage of these subsidies as it does for for the clean folks. I don't believe that future is possible because all of us are going to work to make sure that it won't be. But, you know... We gotta, we gotta keep working at this. Mm-hmm. And, and we need one last point. I'm overdoing, doing it. Mm-hmm. We need a set of very ambitious climate, um, and energy and health regulations from the Biden administration. They're in a race against time. They need everyone's support <coughs> to get done standards for oil and gas fields, transportation, heavy duty trucks and cars, both for power plants. We got to get all that done so that all of this money that's in play is going to the clean stuff, not the dirty stuff. Minister Gobo, you wanted to chime in? If I can reassure you, <laughs> I, I, I said we were sued on carbon pricing in Canada. I'm, I'm, I'm also sued on uh, our single-use plastic ban by some of our provinces and companies. Um, we are also sued on uh, the reform impact assessment regime, which, God forbid, includes indig- the, the perspective of Indigenous peoples in, in impact assessment in Canada now, as well as climate change, because mm-hmm. why would we do impact assessment if if not for, uh, amongst other things, climate change? I, I will get sued on on the cap on on oil and gas emissions, likely get sued on the clean electricity regulation as well. So often when I but come back, you win. well, we've won <laughs> we've won on pricing. We're confident we will. And and sometimes 
I, I was an environmentalist. I, I, I guess I still am an environmentalist, but I was in the environmental movement for, for 25 years. I'd worked at Greenpeace. I'm a co-founder of a large Canadian uh, ENGO. And um, I, 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 I like to think of myself as an environmentalist. So when I, I come back home and my kids ask me how my day went, I'm tempted to say today was a good day. I got sued. <laughs> uh, for what we're trying to do on uh, on climate or nature or or plastics, and if I haven't got soon, perhaps because I, I didn't work hard enough that that day. Uh, we have a premier of a province in Canada that, for purely ideological reason, is blocking thirty billion dollars worth of investment in clean tech and renewables. Uh, thousands of jobs at at, at risk, uh, just like what we're seeing in some of uh, of U.S. states. So. Uh, so that that battle is is still is still very real, and and it's not just in the U.S. It's in certainly in Canada and, and other parts of the world, which is why the work you're you're doing on on, on communications and and climate literacy is is so important. And we're trying to change the way we do communications in Canada mm -hmm. to include more of this mm -hmm. best available science and knowledge in terms of the, how we communicate with with our public about that. Because you're right, there's a in that province where all those those clean projects have just been stopped by the premier. Uh, there's a poll that came out this morning. 69% of people in that province support climate action. Support climate action by the federal government. It's the part yes. of the country where the federal government is the least popular. 69% uh, of, the, of the people in, in there support federal action to put a cap on the emissions of the oil and gas sector. So you're right. There, there is There is a lot of public support for what we're trying to do, but there's also lots of political battles that are that have to be fought. Yeah. Jason, I want to I want to come to you to hear some of your thoughts on um, the U.S. climate program that we're talking about. But I want to frame it a little first in in, in the the geopolitical context, and maybe have you talk about not just what's happening in the U.S. but compare it to some of the other climate action agendas that are appearing uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll start by referencing some, a comment that you made on your recent appearance on the Ezra Klein podcast. Um, you were talking about how, you know, in some ways, when you talk about the energy transition moving from oil and, and fossil fuels to renewables, that in many ways it's it might be more of an addition, uh, where the concept is like oil and other fossil fuels only kind of plateau, and then we just add renewable production on top of it. We have we're burning more coal around the world uh, than ever before, according to the IEA. I think you'd mentioned that we're we're still burning as much wood as as we were, you know, a century and a half, two centuries ago. Um, and so, you know, when the IRA actually happened, um, it was a, a, a compromise measure. Senator Manchin from West Virginia, a, a big fossil fuel state, wanted to have all these energy security measures as he pitched it, um, you know, more oil leasing offshore. And this, in, in part, his rationale was, you know, energy markets were going crazy at the time. Since Russia invaded Ukraine a year and a half ago, you know, prices had gone up for all different types of energy. And so, uh, uh, you know, and that is still an ever-present thing. A lot of countries around the world, not just the U.S., many countries, uh, I think probably of all stripes, are very concerned about energy security, um, maybe just as much or, or more so than some of their climate programs. That, that's kind of what I want to hear you talk about. Like, how much have, have countries retrenched on, on their climate programs because of energy security? And, and how do we see that playing out? in the actual climate solutions um, that they're pushing going forward. Yeah, there's, um, we're a couple of weeks away from the 50th anniversary of the Arab oil embargo. And for the last half century, that sort of obsession mm -hmm. with dependence on imports, the possible weaponization of uh, oil supply, you know, sort of dominated so much of US and other countries' energy policy. Uh, but I think in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, you know, we kind of forgot energy security was a risk. There was maybe a lot of supply. We had the shale revolution in this country. It was more complacency. And obviously that has gone away in the last roughly two years. So energy security is front and center again <clears throat> as a main, a major concern of policy makers. I think Mr. Lebeau would agree. Um, as well as hopefully for many policymakers, urgent decarbonization. Mm -hmm. And that's both a risk and an opportunity. Um, if because I think the the lesson in the near term, do you need some more LNG supplies to make up for and fill your gas inventories in Europe? Yes, uh, a few coal plants get fired up because you got to make sure you get through a cold winter if the winter's cold. But in the long run, like if we needed any reminder 
that the best thing you could do, not just for decarbonization, but for your energy security, is to reduce your dependence on globally traded hydrocarbons, inevitably exposed to geopolitical risk. It's what we've seen in Europe in the last uh, two years. And, and I do think it has helped to propel um, Reed Joe Manchin's statement of support for the Inflation Reduction Act. It is also about America's uh, energy security, and, and we have um, the U.S. economy and, and, and the economic opportunities created by this transition very much front and center now. I think on the IRA, I would just maybe say two things. One is how critically important it is to now implement effectively this very large, very complicated law. Some of that is how do we build a clean energy infrastructure faster, or the broad category of so-called permitting reform, but do that in a way which I think Abby thinks about probably almost every day without, it's easy to build things if you run over uh, indigenous and tribal concerns, but not uh, ignore other ecosystem and biodiversity concerns. So we got to make sure we don't do it that way. And, and that's hard. Uh, we need to do a lot of, we need to do mining, right? We need critical minerals for this transition. I do want a, a slight diversion, sorry to take time, but, but I just, on the mining it's topic. your show, Jason. For, you know, <laughs> We're all here for you. <laughs> Catherine, Catherine mentioned efficiency and conservation, and we really shouldn't forget that. And, and, and critical minerals is an area where that comes up. Uh, yes, we need more mining for sure, especially if we want to reduce dependence on, say, China, where most of the minerals are refined and processed today. But I was struck, well, I don't know, watching, I think it was the US Open or something, you watch TV commercials, which we don't watch that much on streaming anymore. You know, every other ad was for uh, cars that go 400, 500 miles. Those are big batteries with a lot of minerals in them. We have professors here working on fast charging. You could charge in a couple of minutes instead of 45 minutes or hours. Uh, a vast charging network with, if you could charge really fast, might allow people to feel comfortable with smaller batteries that have fewer minerals, but allow you the range and freedom you need. Innovations in electrochemistry that don't require lithium ion, but maybe sodium ion and minerals that are more plentiful. Innovations in recycling. We need more minerals, yes, but maybe we can change the shape of the curve and through efficiency and conservation. Uh, implementing the IRA is complicated geopolitically, right? So we're Provisions in that have sparked trade concerns, not just in Europe, but other parts of the world. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time this week at Climate Week with leaders from emerging and developing economies who don't have the money that the US or Europe has. You're throwing all of this money at supporting investment in clean energy. What about us? You're stealing investment from us. Maybe that hydrogen project would have come here. How do they respond? And how do we make sure we don't get into a downward spiral of tit-for-tat retaliation, but we kind of work together because we need more cooperation, especially at a time of great power rivalry, where if we depend on... China for all the cheap solar panels and batteries and electric vehicles, that raises other economic and security concerns. And then I think it's, you know, this, as, as Abby said, this is a historic achievement, major area of focus for the advocacy and policy community. And now we got to think about what comes next. And for me, what has to come next is the IRA was a historic achievement to address emissions, not fully, but in a major way for 12% of the world's emissions. And we need to do much more in foreign policy and climate policy and international economic policy to dramatically accelerate the pace of capital deployment into clean energy, particularly in emerging and developing economies. That's going to be front and center at COP. It's a major need. We have Andrew Kamau here from the Energy Center. I know we have a couple of minutes at the end for questions. Maybe he can he can offer a thought who help lead the Kenyan Energy Ministry and, and leads our Energy Opportunity Lab here. It's a big priority for what we're trying to do at the at the Energy Center here at Columbia. Before we go to audience questions, I want to I want to fit in two uh, two last questions, uh, but I will I will beg you just because uh, Minister Gabo and Catherine, I, I want to hear from you in a couple things, but I want to get you both in. So just I, I hate to force you to just like be concise, but like please, <laughs> um, Minister Gabo, you're Gabeau. asking a politician not to. Speak. I, you know, <laughs> that's why that's why I am begging. Yeah, I, I, mean. I don't think I'd have success any other way. So, um, but yes, I I, I want you. Um, to give us the cross border view about what Jason was talking about mm -hmm. on the geopolitical issues, especially because right now you and, and so many, I mean, thousands, at least hundreds, if not thousands of diplomats are, are in New York mm -hmm. from all over the world to talk about, among other things, the, the climate change problem. Um, how has the way the U.S. has done its climate program changed what Canada wants to do, changed what other countries are, are doing? And, and and how much friction is it created, especially you know at in diplomatic talks like what's going on right now uh, about you know the, the influence that the U.S. is having this way? 
Well, I think Jason touched on some of the challenges we're seeing with with uh, the implementation of IRA, but but IRA was also viewed by many around the world as a game changer. I mean, I I, I can't communicate to you because it's it's a secret, but the cabinet conversation we had when IRA came up and we all sat around the cabinet table and we went, holy moly, like, and, and I'm sure the Europeans were having the same type mm-hmm. of conversation and the Chinese and the Japanese and the Indians. So th- there is there is tensions, obviously, that, that have been created for all sorts of reasons. And I think unseen, con- unforeseen consequences of, of, of IRA, perhaps. Um, but but there's also lots of positive things that 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 IRA is contributing on on the international debate on on, on climate change. I mean, COP, the, the climate change negotiations are, are complex. They're 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 difficult. They're they're challenging. We saw that very little progress was achieved at the G20 in, in, in New Delhi uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, G7, on the other hand, in Japan, was able to make uh, progress on a number of things, including renewables, phase out of unabated fossil fuels. It's the first time we have a, an international agreement where this is agreed upon. We've never had that before. We've had conversation about it. But um, so there's but we also I mean, we've proven in Montreal at COP15 on, on, on the Nature COP mm-hmm. that we can get together as a concert of nation and, and tackle some really complex and difficult issues. And then we came to New York for, for, for the high seas. Mm-hmm. A treaty, which was 30 years in the making. Well, we had an agreement in Montreal, and a few few months later, we have an agreement in New York on on, on a high seas protection. So we can still do these things, and often mm-hmm. because climate change has been it's become so, so loaded with so many different um, issues and challenges, we lose sight of the fact we can still do these things. We have this ability, even if it's challenging, if it, even if it's complicated. And Catherine, I hate to do this, but you're going to get about 60 seconds for this answer. So I'm, I'm really sorry. That's okay. But, uh, this morning, the Weather Channel called me a soundbite machine. <laughs> Let's see if that actually you are, you are well suited for this then. Um, it's a little bit of a curveball still on the topic of the Inflation Reduction Act, mm-hmm. but tying in some of what you said before, like we've been talking a lot about policy, diplomats, mm-hmm. you know, abstract stuff. And, and I want to talk about people for a mm-hmm. second. Mm-hmm. We, we were speaking yeah. about like how how frequently it is that people just don't know that this giant climate bill was passed. Yeah. I was out, I'll give you a preview of my upcoming reporting if you want to check it out in the Washington Post. I was out in, in Las Vegas for a story along these lines. And I, I will tell you the first striking thing is people, um, you know, maybe it's Vegas, it's so hot, they're worried about Lake Mead and how low it is, but people of all political stripes there very quick to say climate change is happening, mm-hmm. we see it every day, mm-hmm. we know something is wrong. But across the board also have no idea, uh, very little idea um, uh, that, that this bill was passed. Um, re- Republicans don't, don't know, but even, you know, I, I spoke with a Democrat, a big Bernie Sanders person who really wants Washington to do something about climate change. She said that she thought the Inflation Reduction Act was about raising interest rates, right? So what, and this is common, like this is, I, it's, it's hard to believe, but like, Everybody I talked to had some story like this. And this person is somebody who talks, she said she talks politics every day for her job, but still did not know. So, you know, you understand the difficulties of communicating on the science issue. Like, like what is going on with people <laughs> just broadly and like what they're hearing, what they're being told uh, and how big of a problem is that? So... We are 60 seconds, please. <laughs> Sorry. We're here. We need to be there. Think of it, it as a row of dominoes, each one of which is a different solution. And we've been knocking over an individual domino at a time. What's the first domino in the chain? Communication. If people don't understand why it matters, why would they care? If they don't know what to do with it about it, why would they support action? So we need communication, not only about what is happening here and now, not the polar bears, not the ice sheets, my home, my family, my job, and that's only half the coin. The other half of the coin is we need communication on what the solutions look like and how they benefit you here and now, your family, the place where we live. And I do not see any governments stepping up to the plate on the type of communication that is needed to build the political will to really turn this around. The worry is there, the concern is there, the awareness is there, but the knowledge and support for solutions isn't. And I know from communication science, we can fix it. You're very good at that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so we do want to shift um, to some audience Q and A at this point. Um, if you're joining via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, I think we have a mic that's floating around. So hands raised. I, I just saw uh, this gentleman go first. Hi, 
Uh, thanks so much, uh, everybody, for this afternoon's talk. Quick question for the panel. When you think about government regulation in terms of maybe less carrots and more sticks, what are some policies that can be implemented that, can e that cannot easily be rolled back mm -hmm. in the next administration? Excellent question. That's a very good question. Kathy, if you want to go first, I feel like you deserve more time, please. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's not... <laughs> Okay. I would just say, yes, that is the trillion dollar question. I want to know the answer. I, I would say quickly, first of all, more sticks and more carrots. <laughs> um, and speaking for the U.S., there are many laws that are less, that are, have big support. Um, if you'd asked me if the Clean Water Act would have been gutted as it just was last term, I would have said, I hope not because it'll be politically unpopular. So don't, I'm not going to take politically popular bedrock laws to the bank. Mm. Um, we have now a, a, a doctrine that the Supreme Court has kind of invented and now applied several times, which is that if anything the president does has significant consequences in the eyes of the court, they will go back and see whether Congress specifically allowed for that particular action. Our laws were passed in the 1970s, and the premise of, of modern government is that you put a big directional uh, requirement out there and experts implement it. So your question is the gigantic question now in the United States. And I think the political pressure on the court to deal with what is happening to us in our homes, in our workplaces right now in climate change is going to increase. And either the court is going to have to change or people are going to have to moderate their views because we have many laws in the books that drive scientific and health based requirements where the science is there, the facts are there, and the mandate to government is clearly there and taking action should be within laws that we've understood well over many years. Minister? This is something we as a government struggle with um, every day, and, and not just we in Canada or in the U.S., but as we're witnessing a, a rising populism uh, amongst democracies around the world, uh, many of us are trying to think of ways where we can, I mean, a democratically elected government has the mandate of the people to do what they feel is right. And uh, so it's always a bit of a challenge. We are using certain mechanism in Canada, for example, on carbon pricing. We're using this mechanism called contracts for differences, where we're signing contracts with companies where we're locking in carbon pricing for billions and billions of dollars with companies uh, over time, so all the way to 2040, uh, and maybe even beyond. So in theory, the government, a new government elected that doesn't believe in climate change could come back and say, we want to, we want to be rid of this. They could do it, but it, they would have like billions of dollars on their books the first year. So it's, it's not, it's not impossible for them to do it, but it's a serious disincentive to do that. And we're talking, we're trying to think of, of, of other mechanisms like that, that we can use to try and lock in as much as possible these, uh, these type of mechanisms. And I'm not, not going to mm -hmm. take, take time to answer that except to refer people or put in a plug for the weekly podcast. We have the next episode drops in two hours and it's this week with Brian Deese, uh, the head of the national, mm -hmm. former head of the national economic council and architect of the IRA. And he just released with some partners, something called the clean investment monitor. We're actually tracking where clean energy investment is happening. A lot of red states and we talk about that question so maybe people can check it out uh you've all been such a wonderful audience and i'm delighted to see so many people here but i want to give a shout out to the people way in the back corner <laughs> yeah. who joined us with an obstructed view is there anyone back there <laughs> any of you wonderful people who wants to take a question i feel like one of you deserves it most if, if, if there's anybody back there oh. it looks like there is but i can't see <laughs> 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 Please tell us your name because I don't. I, I'll never know what your You're face. There we go. I'm over here. Um, thank you. Um, great discussion. Um, it seems clear. I mean, a lot of folks talked about carbon pricing. Um, it seems that in the world's largest economy, there's a clear need and imperative for carbon pricing, but it's clearly not on the agenda right now in Washington. Um, so how do we get it back on the agenda? Maybe there's some insights from Canada about what went into civil society, mobilization, advocacy, policy development, or communications 
to bring it back onto the agenda because it doesn't seem like the trajectory we're on right now, even post IRA is going in the direction of carbon pricing, even though it seems that we need to really change that. Do you want to offer expert. thoughts from I, the Canadian expert? I mean, Catherine would say that none of our countries passed a test of climate communications, but we, we try hard in, in, in Canada. And I think um, we made a commitment in, during the 2015 election uh, that we were going to do that. And, and we tried to put it in very layman's term uh, as much as possible. It was mm -hmm. about, about putting a price on pollution. Mm -hmm. So my stepdad in my hometown of Lexuk, you have to really look it up on a map to be able to find it. I uh, worked at the pulp and paper mill all his life, doesn't understand a whole lot about climate change, but he understands that pollution is bad mm -hmm. and, and not letting pollution be free is, is a good thing, is, is rather a good thing, and, and that big polluters should pay. And that's really how we, we we've tried to, to 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 bring it forward. But as I said, you know, there's put there's pushback. I mean, we we've resisted. We've we fought three federal elections on on this. We will likely fight a fourth one. So it's not we we haven't. But it's not. It's certainly not a done deal by any stretch of the imagination. I think there is uh, one of the things we're doing. I think which is also helping in Canada. We recycle 90% of the revenues directly back to households. Mm -hmm. And we're telling, and, and people are receiving quarterly payments in their bank account, federal government. We're working with banks to make sure that it says climate incentive payment <laughs> um, so that yeah. people understand that we're helping them in this transition mm -hmm. towards lower economy future. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, we're not imposing this upon them, but but we're helping them through that journey. This is also, I think, one of the one of the reasons that mechanism has been more successful in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I would add on that note, where does the idea of carbon pricing come from? It comes from pretty much every economist in the world who agrees that in a capitalist market, that's the most effective mechanism to drive down uh, carbon emissions. And today, there is a price on carbon on about 25% of our carbon emissions around the world in over 70 jurisdictions. And in Canada, it was rolled out in several provinces first before it became a federal policy. And I just wanted to, hi to highlight two very important points that you made that were excellent communication. And number one is, <laughs> not you personally, but in terms of the, in terms of the government, pollution. Everybody understands pollution is bad. So rather than getting into the mechanics of greenhouse gases, it is pollution. And we're going to make polluters pay. That's, that's a message that people can understand that resonates with them. And then the other reason why carbon pricing is so effective is because it reinvests, especially in low to middle income households, so they are not the ones being penalized that the price signal actually goes where you intend it to go. And instead, you can use those funds to support those households and to invest in efficiency and um, public transportation and other things that help people have a better life as well. So what needs to be done, in my opinion, with both the IRA and with carbon pricing, with all of our solutions is people are awake. People understand the risks today. People's levels of worry over this and awareness of the problem and the risk are skyrocketing. Now is the time to step up and say, we have solutions and this is what they look like. Did you know there's actually legislation that's already been enacted and it's investing in this and that and accomplishing this and that? Here's how you can make a difference. Here's what more remains to be done, but here's how far we've already come. We can do this. And that's the message that we need today. Before we wrap up, is there a question from one of the Zoomers who, who joined us that, that we want to take? The, the truly most obstructed yeah, view actually, of all? <laughs> Pick one and read one. So uh, one of the questions is, uh, how do you address the issue of high gas prices at the pump being a threat to getting elected or reelected? Oh, well, that sounds like a minister go <laughs> um, That's a very good question. In fact, one of the measures we've um, we've implemented, what I have impl implemented, the clean fuel regulations, has resulted in one area of the country in a three to six cents uh, increase in, in in a liter of gasoline. We use liters in, in Canada. <laughs> uh, I can I can never remember the the conversion to gallons, but um, yeah, can we? <laughs> <laughs> just under four. Yeah. Just, just under four. Catherine, uh, four. Science the one who does. Well, that's actually it's creating a a huge debate um, in 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 that part of the country, and and I'm I, I'm under uh, attack even by some of my own colleagues in my party saying, Minister, do something about this. Um, so it, it it's challenging, but 
I mean, that's also what that's what those tools are designed to do to make fossil fuels more expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that carbon pricing, clean fuel regulations, we're it's inevitable. Uh, and, and I think our role as governments and policymakers is, as I said earlier, to make the trend to help people in this transition as much as we can. Uh, and, and and that's how we make it more politically palatable. Right. But but it, it it is controversial and it, and it is politically challenging. It would be so easy for my prime minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, to say, "Listen, Stephen, you know, lots of headwinds, a bunch of premiers uh, fighting you publicly, going against what you're doing. Um, why don't you you know step off the the the, the, the gas or the electric paddle uh, a little bit?" Uh, but we're not doing that because um, if if there was ever a reminder of why we need to act on climate change, the summer we've just had in Canada yeah. with record level forest fires, uh, people in many of our cities couldn't couldn't breathe. I mean, Ottawa is just like Washington. Most of the time, it's purest air as you can think. Uh, in in at the end of uh, middle of June, uh, the air quality in Ottawa was worse than it is in in Delhi or or Calcutta in India uh, because of the forest fires. It came all the way down to to here in, 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 in New York. So I, I think it's also important for us to remind people of the cost of climate change, of the impacts of climate change. Tens of, tens of thousands of Canadians were displaced this summer because of forest fires. Some people died because of forest fires. And we've had, we've had uh, hurricanes, tropical <clears throat> storms like we've never seen before. We've had floodings like we've never seen before. So I, I think Catherine is right. Mm -hmm. Like people are seeing it, people are getting it. And it's our responsibility as government to give them the tools and, mm -hmm. and to show them how we can do this. Mm -hmm. Jason, if I could have you see us out on that, but, I, but I'm gonna put the same 60 second limit that I put on Catherine on sure. you. And I just wanna put my own little twist on this question. You know, We saw oil prices in recent days, crude uh, hitting $95 a barrel for the first time over the past couple of years. Biden's poll numbers have been seemingly really tied to, to, to retail gasoline prices. You know, how, do you see this as, as the, the biggest risk to climate policy in, in the U.S. going forward? I don't think it's the biggest risk to climate policy, but rising gasoline prices are a very significant political and economic concern. That was my experience when I had the privilege to serve in the Obama uh, White House. And it will surely be a concern for is a concern, I'm sure, for this administration going into an election year. The truth is in the near term, which is there's not a lot, there are a few tools in the toolbox. We have a strategic stockpile of oil about we've used about half of it. So it's a much smaller tool than it was before. You, you say what could make a difference in gasoline prices in the very near term? The biggest tool out there is still the fact that the members of OPEC, particularly Saudi Arabia, have a couple of million barrels a day of oil that they could put on the market very quickly, so-called spare capacity. And that is a reminder that notwithstanding the fact that the US is on a net basis, barely importing uh, any oil at all anymore, that doesn't make us energy independent. You're still connected to a global market. And the thing that makes you more secure is reducing your dependence on oil in the first place, not producing more or importing less. The problem is reducing that dependence takes time. It's not something you do when gasoline prices surge and you're worried about next month's or six months from now election. So we say that, and then we get super concerned about it. And then the crisis of the moment passes, gasoline prices come down and we lose focus and we forget <laughs> to stay the course in reducing our, our, our dependence on oil in the first place, which is what we need to do for climate and also what we need to do for our own economic uh, and security, economic security. So, so I think that's the lesson. There are there there are some near term things, but actually not a huge number. And really, the thing that'll make us most secure and reduce our vulnerability to gasoline price volatility uh, may not be what you do immediately, but it's going to help you in the next. Inevitably, there'll be another gasoline price spike. It's going to happen again and again. We want to stay the course to make sure that we're more resilient next time. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank. All of you, especially, I, I, I have mad respect for all of you sticking <laughs> with us for an extra few minutes to finish up here. I do want to remind everyone um, that the full video recording of this event is going to be available on the Center uh, on G uh, Global Energy Policies website in a few days. I'm going to learn the name of the center <laughs> that invited me to do this at some point. I don't know when. Uh, maybe after I check out the video on the website. Uh, so please uh, consider joining us for the next CGEP event. Uh, it's called The Politics and Geopolitics of Latin America's Energy Transition. It's taking place tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, and uh, a full list of upcoming events uh, can be found on the Center on Global Energy Poli uh, Policies website. 
Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you once again for joining us.